you know, I didn't even know what the word agorist meant until just recently. I'm still kind of confused about it, actually. Maybe someone can tell me a little bit about exactly what it means, but I guess I've always been living that way. Uh, and so what I thought I might do is tell you how I've been living my life for the last 20 years and how it has been agorist, as far as I understand the word agorist. And, uh, but I've never even known that was a word. I just, I just don't want any government involvement in anything I do on anything. And so I've always avoided that. Uh, of course, you still have to use some things, uh, but I've got some information on that as well. But so I started out uh, in Canada, and uh, I was a very shy uh, young man. I was so shy when I was probably 14, I couldn't even go to a store and ask for gum. Uh, I would just head down, and I couldn't even ask them, and I'd start shaking. And it wasn't really good because I also really started to like girls a lot around then, <laughs> and I couldn't talk to them. So. I sort of, uh, around the end of high school, I realized I had to make a change in my life. So I thought, what's the most extreme thing I can do to get myself out of this? I always like to do that. Whenever I have a, something I want to solve, I like to just do the most craziest thing you could possibly do, like go all the way or nothing. So rap music had just come out in the last few years. This is like 1987. And I thought, I'll become a rapper, because I like rap. And that'll make me go on stage. <laughs> and. Uh, <clears throat> So I did, and I was actually the number two or three white rapper in Canada in 1991 or two. <laughs> <laughs> I was, you can look it up. You know, the number one, uh, probably no one here knows this, was Tom Green, you know, the actor? He's actually one of the best rappers around, still to this day. And um, so I quite quickly realized I was not gonna be able to compete with Tom Green, and there's a bunch of other guys that are way better than me. So I uh, ended up, you know, I was making all this music, it was all on my own computers, and, and back then it was really very basic style, but uh, I was making really good music, but my rapping wasn't the greatest, and um, so I thought, I'll start producing music. So that was my first sort of uh, enterprise, and it was nothing big, it was just, um, uh, I just had a little home studio, just all just computers and stuff, and microphones. And I ended up having people come over. I'd produce tracks for them. Uh, I'd also have voiceover people uh, come over and record it. My, this is just my uh, condo while I was still working at a bank. I'd do it in the evenings. And um, uh, for those of you who know Anarchast, by the way, uh, the video, the, the podcast that I do, uh, the, the voiceover that goes, this is Anarchast. That's actually one of the top voiceover people on Earth. His name is David Sobolov, and he's a good friend of mine. He used to record at my place. So that's how it kind of got started. And I was like, I like this sort of a business. I like that I can do it, and it's all cash, and I'm not having to get involved with all kinds of government and employers and all those, all those things you have to file. Um, but it wasn't making a lot of money. So by then, it was around 1994, and I was still working at a bank. And uh, the internet came out. And I thought to myself, you know, this is huge, this is massive, because I, I had always been a computer nerd my whole life, and that's probably why it's, uh, or maybe not why, but like it fit with my shyness. I was always just with my computer. And um, I recognized it right off the bat. I said, this is gonna change the world. So I, I looked at what I wanted to do on the internet. And uh, I was into stock market at the time, for whatever reason, I was working at a bank. I wanted to be a broker. And I, um, so I, I said, I'm gonna start up a financial website on the internet. Uh, there was, at that time, you couldn't get even stock quotes on the internet. This is 1994. So I just started, what I actually started doing, and actually most of the businesses I start, I always start them with really zero capital, and I put no capital in, which I, I find is quite nice, because then you really have no risk. Uh, you just have uh, all reward potential. So I started uh, designing websites for public companies just to get it off the ground. And it was really funny back then, 1994, I, um, you know, you go to a, a company, like a, a mining company in, in Canada, and say, you guys need a website. And they'd say, what's a website? <laughs> and then i go, it's on the internet. And they go, what's the internet? <laughs> so I went through that for a number of years. But, I, you know, that's slowly convincing people. And we started getting quite a few clients who were making websites for public companies. And back then, even, I, I realized I was going to be making decent money, and I didn't want to... Uh, have the government involved in anything I did. And I, I didn't even realize an, I was an anarchist back then, but I was. And so I started an offshore company, uh, I, you know, opened up an offshore company, which was a lot harder back then than it is now. All legal, 
Um, you know, you can talk about fine lines on legalities with some of these things, but uh, they're really, you can set these things up very legally uh, so that it's, you know, Mitt Romney, I think, has hundreds of offshore companies. Uh, you know, it's actually all legal, most of this stuff, and you can set all this stuff up legally. So I started this uh, offshore, and I was just, you know, doing a lot of the income through that company. And, um, and then that, that company grew and it, out of my house, and it was... Uh, at its peak in 2000, it was worth about $240 million, called Stockhouse.com. It's still the top financial website in Canada. And um, uh, so then I had to get more involved, obviously, because we we're going to go public on the stock market. So you obviously can't do a lot of this agorist stuff in that way. There was no Bitcoin stock market back then or anything. So we had to file properly and you know, look at taxes and all that kind of stuff. So that was uncomfortable. But I, uh, and then the tech bubble burst, and I thought, you know, what just happened? Because my company that was worth a quarter billion dollars is now worth almost nothing. And no one had an explanation for it. So I really just traveled and uh, I had some money left from, you know, the, I actually ended up selling the company in 2002 for not too much, but it was enough to live for a while. And I bought a boat and I, I tried to sail around the world and sunk it in El Salvador about a year later. <laughs> and, uh, and I just kept going by backpack for a while. And I was just searching for information because none of this stuff made sense to me uh, about economics and finance and why do we have these bubbles? And I came upon, upon Austrian economics, which explained it perfectly. So it was just, light bulb just goes off. It's like, oh, it's so obvious. They're just printing a bunch of money. So, um, so I went on from there and I didn't really do too much for the next five years. I mostly just traveled and tried to learn. I just spent a lot of time just learning and learning and learning. So after that, uh, I started uh, the Dollar Vigilante. So here's another example for people. Uh, it was just a blog. Uh, it still is just a blog. Uh, well, it's a, a lot more than that now, but it, it still has a blog. And um, I just started talking about all this information. And it started getting quite a good audience. And I started to realize well, first of all, I started a newsletter with it. And of course, by this point, I already had, I moved out of Canada, uh, officially expatriated or, or renounced or defected from Canada. And uh, luckily for Canadians and most countries on earth, except for Americans, Americans are one of the most enslaved people on earth at this moment in time. Uh, if you leave your country and you're actually a resident of another country, you only have to pay taxes in the country you're a resident of. And so that's something that I do, um, a uh, lifestyle called permanent traveler, a perpetual tourist. So I became a resident of a Car Caribbean country which had no taxes that applied to me. So now everything I do, there's no, well not everything, I I'll go into that a little bit, but most things I do, there's no government involvement at all. It's all offshore, all legal, all 0% tax. Uh, and there's so many ways to set things up like that. Um, Actually, I should backtalk a bit. There was one other business I started before Dollar Vigilante. I was, and this is very interesting. I think a lot of people will find this interesting. Is I was in Acapulco, Mexico, and I found this uh, uh, like a condo building. It's about 30 stories. It's actually two towers, 30-story towers, and they were selling condos on the beach in Acapulco for around fifty thousand dollars. And um, I knew because I looked around at the market that was quite cheap. So I bought one there, and then I thought, you know, in, and this is another thing for people who are looking at doing business. Around the world, most people still haven't caught on to how to do business and how to get their, comp in, their companies on the internet and stuff. So I looked around, and I knew this from personal experience, because I went to Acapulco, and I wanted to buy a condo, because uh, I'd stopped there on my, my sort of around the world trip and it was my favorite place, one of my favorite places. So I wanted to go there, live there for a while. So I wanted to buy a condo. There was nothing on the internet. You just look, Acapulco condos, zero results, you know? And uh, if there was anything, it was all in Spanish, which I didn't speak very well at the time or at all, really. And I thought, man, all I have to do is find out what condos are available in this building and put up a website and offer them for sale. And so that's what I did. So I went to the real estate company downstairs who had a bunch of condos, but they had no website. They, it's still to this day, they don't have a website. And uh, I just started offering them and, and I started getting some interest. And so I started selling condos and then I thought, um, you know, a lot of these people who are buying them, they're not going to be living here full time. And they're all the, basically the same layout. 
And so why, why don't I talk to them about renovating all their condos, making them exactly the same, not exactly, but like similar with a flat screen TV, all very nice stuff, and renting it out. So that's happened. And uh, you know, this just kept going and going to the point where I own a hotel now in Acapulco. Just so you know, and I don't know how much I want to say if this is going on the internet, but um, that was, there's no company involved. It's just my own private PayPal account. Um, you know, people want to rent, and then you can accept credit cards with PayPal, and it just goes through. There's no, no company owns either the real estate condos uh, business I have or the hotel itself. It's just out there on the internet, and things happen. So that's fairly agorist. Um, so, yeah, that, so that's uh, one thing I wanted to kind of get across is you can do a lot of businesses like that, especially outside of the U.S. The U.S. is different. The U.S. is like the worst of both worlds right now. It's, it's uh, got lots of entrepreneurial-minded people, a lot of people who understand business, and so there's a lot of competition. But then at the same time, it's all kind of collapsing now, and the, the business environment is terrible. Uh, there's you know, really difficult to even do any startup business here anymore. Uh, to start up a lemonade stand is, you know, first of all, you'll probably get arrested. Uh, second of all, uh, if you actually want to do all the things the government tells you to do, it's literally tens of thousands of dollars to open a lemonade stand. You have to get all kinds of stamps and approvals and medical inspections and health inspections and insurance. So you, it's the worst of both worlds right now. You have a ton of competition and you have really, it's very difficult to get ahead. And then you don't even talk about taxes and all that. It's almost impossible to really uh, get a business going very well here nowadays. The uh, founder of Subway restaurants, he actually founded in the 60s, I didn't know that. He said last year, he said, if I was going to try to start Subway today in the US, it'd be impossible. And I totally understand because there's so much cost just to start up something like that now. You have to, all these regulations and all that kind of stuff. Whereas I'm sure when he started it, he probably just rented a place and got some bread and some meat and there I'm doing business, right? Nowadays, <laughs> cannot do that. You just get raided constantly by armed gang members uh, who want all kinds of uh, extortion fees in mafia uh, government. You know, the biggest, they're bigger than the mafia. But you really can't do that kind of stuff uh, in the US very easily anymore. You still can, but I highly advise you not to. Um, I would really suggest to people, especially with the internet nowadays and, and with things like Bitcoin, which actually maybe I'll talk a bit more about that later because I think that's a huge opportunity. You can really arrange your fares with almost any business. Of course, it's not like a, if you're a mechanic, you can't arrange it all over the internet, although it's almost getting to that point with technology. But uh, it, try to f uh, found companies that are quite uh, easily amenable to uh, internet. Uh, and then you can actually found them and incorporate them somewhere else if you need a corporation. Uh, all legal, like I said. Uh, not many people know this. And, and, and many of the things about the US is they don't teach anyone this stuff. They don't want you to know. But the really smart people, the, biz the people who make a lot of money, know this stuff. And they've been doing it for decades. Um, there's all kinds of examples. Um, you look at someone like Warren Buffett or um, who was the other one that uh, there's a few that recently said, oh, we're, we're so ph philanthropy-minded that uh, we're going to donate most of our money to charity. It wasn't charity. It was, they put all their money offshore into an offshore charitable remainder trust, which they operate and use for whatever they want, and they get a huge tax write-off. Uh, we actually do that, by the way, and it's all legal. Uh, we help people do those sort of things. It's actually not that expensive. In the old days, 10, 20 years ago, when these guys were doing it, it was expensive to do this stuff, but it's almost becoming a uh, commodity now, offshore banking and, and corporations and stuff like that. So you can kind of do those things nowadays. Uh, and there's all sorts of angles on how to do these things. And it's really, uh, it, I'm amazed at how many people, I'll talk to some people and I'll say, hey, you've got a internet company. It does whatever it does. Let's just say it does web design and makes $100,000 a year, whatever it does. Um, and, but they'll actually file that and they'll take it as personal income if they're American and actually pay taxes on it when they don't have to, all legally. They could actually just open an offshore company, that company, and, and many people are, are, they don't learn about this because they don't want you to know this. They don't teach you this in any schools I, I, that I know of in the US. But you can do it all legally just 
and many companies, just to give you an example, and one of the biggest thing I hear from entrepreneurs is, or just private people who have a company, is, oh, I can't do that. That sounds like tax evasion, or you know, or I, I have a duty to pay taxes, which is, you know, I stopped talking to them right after that. But, um, <laughs> but they really, uh, they're just not. They don't know what you can do, and it's all again, like I said, all legal. So you just open an offshore company that you put all your um, uh, business through it, and many people also don't seem to understand. But I'll tell you, as a business owner. I would much rather have a private contractor. I don't care where the company's from. It doesn't matter to me. If I have a business and I need some services, I don't care if this is a, a Bermuda or Bahamas company that, that's invoicing me. I don't care. That doesn't make any difference to me. I, in fact, I prefer it. I would not want to ever have an employee, especially in the US. All of a sudden, you have all these health insurance and all the, all the stuff you have to do. So uh, most companies are very, very amenable to you Instead of going to them and saying, hey, hire me, and you can do this in almost any business, by the way. You walk up and you say, hey, here's my skills. You, you, you think I could be of value? And they go, yeah, so I want to hire you. And then you go, OK, but it's my company you're hiring, and, uh, and you know, the work will get done. And actually, almost any company who has any brains would prefer that, because there's no filing, no paperwork. It's just an expense, and that's all it is. There's no they have to take money off their paychecks. and unions or I don't even know what they have to get into. So that's the way that people should really be um, thinking if you're going to work in the US. Now, let's talk about the rest of the world. Um, <laughs> it's amazing to me how many people who haven't, I've been to about 100 countries and I currently live in Acapulco, Mexico most of the time, but just as a tourist. Uh, I live in Chile part of the time, uh, building an expat community down there. Uh, so I've seen a lot, and so many people are really don't understand the rest of the world's much, much different than the U.S. Um, I just had a person ask me just uh, 10 minutes ago. She said, you know, how can I go there? I must need all kinds of work visas. And it's like, no, no one cares about that stuff. <laughs> and no, really, they don't have, what do they call those people who come into a restaurant and they like, uh, they find out if some Mexican people are illegal and take them out? What's that? Ice. Ice, yeah. No other country on earth has that. <laughs> and most other countries, they don't care about the government or taxes or anything. Mexico is a perfect example. No one cares. They, they have all kinds of rules and laws, and no one cares. I, uh, I was just talking to a friend, and he lives uh, in San Miguel. Uh, I think he's, oh, he went to see, oh, you, oh, he actually showed up. I thought you wanted to go to uh, uh, see uh, Angela's speech. Oh, I appreciate it. So, um, but he was saying he's a voice, I don't want to, you know, invade his privacy, but he does like uh, audio related stuff. And he was saying, man, I've been in San Miguel in Mexico and every night people are just firing off shots when they're partying. And it's funny because a lot of people here in the US go, oh, I'd never move to the Mexico. Uh, they don't allow guns. It's like, but no one cares. <laughs> Everyone has a gun. They just don't care. Uh, I'll give you an example. I was in Acapulco, and um, I just started smoking. I'm really into it, and uh, <laughs> it's my favorite thing I've been doing. And um, so there's this place I've been going for years and years. It's sort of a beach bar on the beach, and I just work uh, a few times a week from there, have a few glasses of wine and write or whatever. And uh, one day I come in, and I and I started smoking, and I had been smoking. And I, I lit up a cigarette, and a person came out. They said, "I'm so so sorry." They just passed a law. You can't smoke indoors anymore. And I went, what? I was like, are you serious? They're like, yeah, we're really sorry. And I was like, oh, man, this place is just changing. Maybe I'm going to get out of here. So I came back the next day. And they go, come on in, come on in. And I'm like, what, what are you so happy about? He goes, we all decided, forget it. We don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and so still to this day, I sit there and smoke. And no one cares. <laughs> and so the rest of the world's quite different. They don't have this. You know, it's amazing that they've brainwashed people into thinking the U.S. is the land of the free, home of the brave. It's really home of the slave. Um, I'm amazed. I, I show people pictures or videos of what's going on in the U.S. with all the police. They always bust in people's doors, shoot their dogs. And I show that to people in Mexico or Chile or anywhere around the world, and they just look at it like it's from another planet. And they're like, why didn't they stop them? And I'm like, esclavos, slaves. Uh, the, the mentality here is that you just, uh, you know, 
they, they rule you, and whatever they say, you do. And it, it's really sad to me to see how a cop will be beating up like a, a person you care about, like a good friend of yours, for no reason. And the only thing the American guy will do is like, sir, please stop, sir. Like, sir, first of all, this is an armed thug beating up your friend. You do that in Mexico or Chile or anywhere, that cop is dead in two seconds. Um, and, and then you get into this thing with the propaganda. So I'll give you an example. Down in Mexico, they have uh, um, you know, problems with this drug war because the US government has given them billions of dollars, given them all sorts of guns, and they feel like they got to go out and use it. So they go out, they find some guys who have some plants, marijuana or whatever, and they start shooting up their house. Within minutes, the whole town goes and finds all the cops, kills them, chops off their heads. I think that's an Aztec thing or something. I'm not sure about the chopping the heads off. And uh, then usually lights the police station on fire. And then people in the US will go, that's terrible. That's anarchy. Um, you know, they have to respect the police. Like, what? It's crazy. So once you get outside of the US, and this is the worst country on earth, like maybe North Korea is worse. Probably is a little worse. I haven't been there, so I can't say. But it's one of the worst countries on earth. It's just totally, you can't do anything. Everyone respects the government. And uh, it's just a very unfree place. So if you want to be an agorist, this is one of the worst places to be it. But uh, also, you can get under the radar. And that's maybe I'll talk about Bitcoin. There's so many things going on now that you can really uh, do business much more freely. And uh, Bitcoin, I think, is a huge opportunity. To me, Bitcoin is to money what the internet was to communications. It's a huge, massive paradigm shift. And many of you, I'm sure, know all about Bitcoin, so I don't have to explain it. Um, but this is going to change everything, in my opinion. And they can't shut it down. Uh, they can shut down Bitcoin-related businesses, and they did that with, essentially with one that I got involved in. So this was, I was, um, I don't remember exactly, about eight months ago, I was in Guyana in South America looking at a gold mine. And uh, I got an email or a Skype from a friend and he said, hey, we just bought the first, world's first Bitcoin ATM and we've actually got it working now where it's actually fully functional in, in every way. You can put money in, take money out. And that was right when Cyprus happened. And so I'm, I'm looking at the news and it's all banks in Cyprus closed, they're taking all their money. And, um, and I thought, well, let's put out a press release we're going to open the world's first Bitcoin ATM in Cyprus. CNBC, Fox, everyone's calling me. So I got involved with it, but then I, you know, it was getting quite serious now, and everyone's interested, and we have all these people interested in buying them or working with them or franchising and investing. So I called in one of my guys who I really trust back from my internet days, who's a really good finance and tax and legal, because I don't even like to even know about that stuff. I don't even want to deal with it. I just, you tell me if, it's, if I can do it or not, and that's all I want to know. So I called him in and he spent a day uh, down here in San Diego actually uh, with these guys. And within a day he goes, okay, I've talked to some people, I've talked to Ernst & Young, I've talked to lawyers. And he goes, if you do this Bitcoin ATM, you're gonna be under five different regulatory agencies in the US alone. Uh, it's money, banking, securities. They even include telecommunications because Bitcoin uses the internet. So I have to <laughs> file things with, and I, right then, I was like, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. Like, uh, and also, because it was a money transmitter is what they called it. They said, oh, you're a money transmitter, sort of like Western Union. And actually, Bitcoin will destroy the Western Union uh, business model, 100%. Uh, and that's why they want to stop it. So here in the US, of course, because it's all fascist monopolies. And uh, so here in the US, the... Um, uh, to be a money transmitter, you need a $25 million insurance bond just to get into the business. So I'm sitting there thinking, okay, so now we need minimum $25 million. We need 30 or $35 million to get this off the ground if we're going to do it in the U.S. But it's not just the U.S., it's also Europe. Every country has different things. So now I'm thinking, oh, in every country we have to go and do all these things and negotiate? I pretty much wanted out. And uh, luckily, they kind of screwed me on the deal, and, and so I, I was out anyway. <laughs> And uh, I was not like too sad about it. I was like, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to get involved. But the problem with that deal was it's hardware. So if I get involved in another biz Bitcoin business, which I, I almost definitely will, I want it to be completely 
internet. Nothing hard, because once it's hard, because it's funny because the governments still live in the old world where everything's hard. So you see uh, uh, this uh, Edward Snowden and the UK Guardian thing. And so the UK government decides, okay, they, they know information and we got a call from Barack Obama and uh, he wants us to just to, you know, make sure that information doesn't get out. The UK government went to the, uh, the uh, Guardian newspaper in, in London, came in and like started smashing on their hard drives and like shooting them. <laughs> and all the, the journalists and stuff were just laughing. They're like, you never heard of the cloud? <laughs> Like, they just don't understand. They're so stupid, but they're very violent. So, <laughs> so yeah, so I, I, what I try to do now is try to, if I'm going to get involved in a Bitcoin business, I want it to be completely internet. I actually want it to be like Bitcoin itself. So Bitcoin's basically torrent-based. So it's no, there is no place. You can't go to any one place and bash down the door with a SWAT team and shut down Bitcoin. It's on tens of thousands of computers around the world, all voluntarily. So when, if I'm going to do some more businesses, I'm looking into some, although I'm very busy with what I'm doing in Chile right now, but I would definitely want it to be torrent-based as well. I would, and there's, I think there's a lot of potential for businesses there. Um, I looked into doing a Bitcoin poker site, and because I don't know if you know, online poker, the US government shut it down in the US a few years ago. Unbelievable, and not a peep from any US poker players. They're like, well, they said it's illegal. So <laughs> that's fine. Um, but of course, all they were doing was they were just letting the casinos, who are the major lobbyists for the gambling industry, uh, get their internet poker working better so they could compete. And then now it's going to be they own it. So it was basically a, a, another armed robbery, monopoly, <coughs> fascist thing. So when I was approached about and talking to some people about doing a Bitcoin po poker site, I said, we have to find a way to make it so there is no server for this Bitcoin poker site. It has to be designed in such a way that it also is torrent based. So they can't shut it down. The difficult part is if you want to actually get dollars out of it. But if you keep it all Bitcoin based, that is possible. And more and more Bitcoin's catching on. And um, so it's going to be very interesting. There's going to be a lot of, of business opportunities, a massive amount of business opportunities. I would start a Bitcoin insurance company. Um, now, of course, you have to be careful with it and never form it in the US ever. Uh, Coinapult uh, is one of the major Bitcoin related companies. They were based in the US. They all moved to Panama now. Uh, all the, every single person involved in Bitcoin just recently got subpoenaed to New York to testify. You know, I couldn't even imagine if they subpoenaed me. I don't know what I'd do. I definitely wouldn't go. But um, yeah, this is the most heinous, uh, fascistic, oppressive government and most powerful government on earth at the moment. And you do not want to do any sort of business like that here. So if you're going to do it, uh, and you want a corporation, if you need that for whatever reason, maybe you want to bring in investors and they want to see there's a corporation, there's shares, don't incorporate it in the US. Incorporate it wherever. And we actually have at tbvoffshore.com, we help people open offshore companies, all legal. And, uh, and, and, and keep it as, as um, uncentralized as possible. <coughs> So I, was just, I just brought up a Bitcoin insurance. I think there's a lot of opportunity. I was, I've just been talking here at this conference to a few people who didn't really understand Bitcoin all that well. And they said, I'm not sure I'm comfortable doing all these, you know, if I'm going to put a fair amount of money, have it in Bitcoin, I'm not sure I'm comfortable because what if I lose, lose it somehow? This is a valid concern. But we don't need government to get involved. We don't need, what do they call that uh, for the bank accounts? Uh, <laughs> yeah, smart onions. Um, and they're bankrupt, so it's all an illusion that there's safety anyway. Uh, so really this person, if they have all their money in the US bank account right now, they're, they're, in, they're majorly at risk, uh, definitely over the next few years. What happened in Cyprus is gonna happen here. It's gonna happen all throughout Europe. So this person said, well, I'm just not comfortable because I don't understand it, and what if I lose it? And very valid concern. So these are things that Bitcoin entrepreneurs can be doing. Start up a Bitcoin insurance company, start up a Bitcoin bank. Um, you know, if people are comfortable or uncomfortable with the way the Bitcoin is uh, because they're worried and they don't understand it, find ways to make them comfortable and maybe use words that they're, you know, I don't know if I want to call it a bank because then you might get into some sort of, but find ways to communicate to people 
uh, the safety that they're looking for and start up a Bitcoin insurance company. So if you do some major transaction, you're insured, or, or you say you have your Bitcoins at this, maybe the insurance company has certain places, they say, oh, that's a good place to store, we trust them. Uh, you know, this all gets worked out in the free market and the rates and all that kind of stuff, but maybe it's 0.1% uh, a year, and if for whatever reason you lose your Bitcoins, uh, for whatever reason, uh, you're insured, you know? That's a huge business. There's, there's tons of major businesses here. And I really like it because they can't shut down Bitcoin. And they, if you keep the business as uh, internet-based as possible, you really have no uh, physical locations or uh, try to get them decentralized, it's really impossible for them to even shut that down. So there's tons of opportunities. That's the way I see it. I don't know how long, is it an hour? Yes. Okay. That's about all I really wanted to talk about. Maybe a lot of people have questions or anything, or I could just think of a bunch of other things to say. I've got lots to talk about. Oh, okay. Uh, I have a question about the concept of people not caring in foreign countries. So if there are a lot of laws on the books, but the culture or the custom is that nobody cares, do you have a problem of selective enforcement by the government? Yes, obviously every single country is different. But I found I much prefer a corrupt country to a not corrupt country. Um, just as an example, in the US, if I, and I've been handcuffed many times here, for nothing. I, once I was just walking down the street and they said I looked drunk, which I was, but I didn't know that was legal. <laughs> and five squad cars circling me, I'm in handcuffs. And there's no way I can go, hey, 50 bucks, let's, you know, and I, then I can go, right? In a place like Mexico, it, it's just, here's 20 bucks, get out of here. I prefer that because, you know, a lot of the things here, especially now with the real police state, that I have friends, and everyone I'm sure knows people who haven't really done anything wrong at all, and they're in jail for years and years. It's just crazy. Like, once you get into this system, you're in trouble. So I, I prefer a place where you have some options. Uh, and, uh, you know, just as an aside, Chile is not that corrupt, which is one of the things I don't like about it too much. It's, uh, you know, you have to follow most things by the book, but it's also, at the same time, not very oppressive. Uh, the cops are almost like tour guides. Like they, they dress, they look like kind of like a valets at a hotel or something. Um, and they're they're very nice. They're you know they're almost asking people. I've, I've actually seen them ask people like, "Are you okay? Are you lost? Where, where are you trying to go?" You know, like that's more the attitude in those sort of places. So yeah, you can. You know, every country is different. And what I would suggest is if you go to a country, try to get quite connected. So. In Acapulco, Mexico, uh, my wife is apparently very connected, and I've got a lot of stories. I don't know how many I want on the internet, but um, basically we run that town. Anything we want to do. And it's funny because actually the Acapulco jail. Uh, Acapulco, for people who don't know, it's a really interesting place. It's one of my favorite places on earth. And uh, it's because it's almost completely anarchic. Not, not completely, but almost. And, um, you know, Mexico's a big country, and not a lot of people realize this also, that a lot of people just think, oh, they're Mexican, you know? It's, it's as diverse as the U.S. Like, my wife will be sitting there, and she'll start laughing. I'll, I'll, I'll say, why are you laughing? She goes, don't you hear their accent? And she's like, oh, they're from, like, the, the Northeast or something. You know, it's the same as Boston or California or Texas. You, they're very diverse and all that kind of stuff. And um, so the... I forgot, what was I talking about? I kind of lost my train of thought. Oh, the jail in, in Acapulco. So, um, Acapulco is in the southwest, and it's known as the Deep South. Like, no one, they, you go down there, it's lawless. It doesn't mean it's dangerous. It just, even the federal government is scared to go to Acapulco. They're almost like the Texas of Mexico. And they're like, fuck you guys. Like, don't even come here. We'll kill you. And, and they, they're serious. And uh, so finally, the federal government, uh, about a year or two ago, said, we have to find out what's going on down there. And they, they instituted a raid, and they raided the uh, Acapulco jail. I just watched, uh, uh, Gring what's that Mel Gibson movie, Gringo? Get, Gringo? Get the Gringo. I just watched it last night, so this is kind of, uh, if you've seen that movie and you should see that movie, 
the jail was exactly like that. It's, you do whatever you want. It's like a little town inside of a jail, and you have hookers and drugs and, and cockfights, and, and your family can be there. You just have to pay someone, and they have apartments, and it's a fully just a little anarchic little place inside the jail. And that's what they found in Acapulco. They broke in, they found hookers, drugs, alcohol, uh, fighting cocks. They found a peacock. I don't know what that was about. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, you know, every place is different, but I, I'm so connected there through my wife and her family that we can do anything we want. So that's what I would suggest is if you're going to go to a place, try, you know, you don't have to marry someone, obviously. That's something that just happened. But um, try to get to know people, just like anywhere, just like anywhere, you, even in the U.S. You want to get to know, you want to do some sort of business, you better start lobbying, you better start get down, get to know your senator guy. and start doing deals, uh, you have to do the same everywhere. And um, it's not as hard as people think because this is one of the advantages that Americans have that they don't seem to realize. First of all, English is spoken all around the world. So if you're a Chinese guy and you want to start a business in Brazil, good luck, you better learn Portuguese very well. But English, almost anywhere on earth, especially business related, most of the main business people will speak English. So you have a huge advantage. Secondly. Americans are still very respected as being entrepreneurial or capitalists. And when you go into a country and you might not have any sort of reputation or big name or a lot of money, you can go into a country like Cambodia, you have $50 in your pocket, and all of a sudden you're getting invited to like the prime minister's house and stuff like that. <laughs> and they're very curious. They're like, tell me, you know, you know business, how should we do this stuff? You know, like you can make things happen very fast in a lot of these places. Now I'm not saying like that will happen everywhere. A lot of countries are not like Cambodia. Uh, but that's what I found, like when I was in Guyana looking at that gold mine with a friend of mine, because he wanted to buy it, he has quite a bit of money. Yeah, we had a meeting with the president, no problem, and they're all very excited and, you know, so huge advantage. And I really think uh, people are just have too much fear about these things. And it's mostly because of the propaganda on the media and the government that makes the world look crazy and horrible, when actually it's the opposite. Uh, the U.S. is crazy and horrible to me. I don't like being here ever. I, I like coming to this conference because I know, worst case scenario, in 20 minutes I'm in Tijuana, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like I was actually in New York during that Boston Marathon bombing and all my Mexican friends, every time I come to the US, all my Mexican friends go, be care don't go up there, be careful. I'm like, I know, it's, it's, it's very dangerous. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> so I'm in the New York hotel room and the Boston Marathon thing happens. I'm watching it just, you know, I can't believe this is happening. And uh, for, right before they found him in the boat, whoever that young kid was who had cooking supplies and he was very dangerous that they had to shut down the entire city, that um, they said, oh, we think he might have gone to New York. And not many people know this, but Bloomberg came out within a second or two, like no thought at all. He goes, if he's in New York, we're shutting the city down. And I'm sitting there going, Oh, like an anarchist, uh, you know, this is not going to go well for me. So I was starting to pack my bags and then they said, oh, we found him. He's in a boat. And everyone started cheering and USA, USA. And I was like, I was actually happy they found him, whoever he was. He probably didn't do anything. But. So yeah, you have to, you know, you just have to be smart. Uh, thanks to the internet as well, though, you have so much opportunity, so much, it's so much easier. Um, I'm amazed, like a lot, you know, a lot of Americans will say, uh, you know, we have to, you know, USA and our founding fathers, you know, the people who came to the US originally had a lot of risk. Those founding fathers guys were sort of similar to us today and now they're calling us, you know, we're dangerous, we're extremists because we don't believe in the federal government and all that kind of stuff. You know, the average person who arrived at Ellis Island uh, 100 years ago had, in today's dollars, $90 in their pocket, didn't speak the language usually, they usually spoke Italian or whatever language they spoke, and they just heard there was an opportunity here. So now you have people today who might even have $10,000 or, you know, a lot more than those guys did. Uh, they can get on the internet and find out what's going in any country in, on earth. They can uh, find people. We actually have a service, by the way at dollarvigilante.com, it's called TDD Groups. And we actually have libertarian or anarchist people around the world who have expatriated to other countries and they're more than happy to help you with information. And we have dozens and dozens of countries now. And so you can get on there and say, hey, how are you, what's going on? And he'll say this and you get into a conversation and you'll say, what, do you see some opportunities? And they always see opportunities. I see opportunities everywhere. And uh, 
you know, maybe you can, a lot of these people will come and meet you at the airport. We actually have many people here who have gone down to uh, some of our TDV groups, um, one in particular in San Miguel, uh, run by a guy named Jim Carger, and he'll, he's incredibly, he'll pick you up and take you out and show you what's going on and what do you need, what do you want to do. Just amazing people. So you have all these opportunities, but a lot of people are very scared for some reason. I think people are going to realize quite quickly in the next few years that this is the scariest place to be. And I guess if I could say one thing about myself that I, I'm pretty good at, I, I usually tend to be ahead of the crowd. I, t I tend to see the opportunities before most people see them. And that might just be because I'm very open-minded and I'm also very curious and I'm excited about change all the time. Um, or who knows what the reason is, but I, I, you know, I recognized in 1994 the internet was going to be massive. And a lot of people said I was crazy. Back then in 1994, a lot of companies, when I was talking to them, I'd say, you should get your uh, employees on email. And they'd say, oh, that's too dangerous. You know, what if they lost their laptop? You know? And look at it today, right? <laughs> it's crazy. So I'm really foreseeing, and I, I think this is, uh, people should be using this time because it's still not absolutely horrible here yet. It's, it's horrible, but it's not absolutely horrible. But it's going to get much, much worse. It's going to be capital controls, no, no question about it. They already are, basically. They're instituting them in very nefarious ways. They're doing it th through things like FATCA, which basically makes it so no American can open a bank account or an offshore company or a brokerage or anything. Uh, and this all goes into effect in July 2014. So rather than, rather than saying you can't take your money outside of the US, the US government has gone to every country on earth and said, you accept an American client and we'll Syria you, you know? We'll send uh, some Black Hawk helicopters in. And they're serious. I've seen this, I've seen this countless times. Uh, Dominican Republic, I'll give you an example. They used to have a passport citizenship program. It would take three years to get a passport. Uh, and I know because I know, them, just like in a lot of these countries, you get to know all the top people very easily. So I know most of the top people, and then changed to four years, then changed to seven years, all within a couple of years. And then it was eight, now I think it's eight years. And I was talking to them, I'm like, what's going on? They're like, the US government is telling us if we make it easy for people to get foreign citizenship, they're going to do whatever they do, whether it's sanctions or attacks or whatever. So they're actually doing all this stuff. So they're, you know, that, that wall on the Mexican border isn't to keep Mexicans out, it's not. You know, there's actually more Mexicans leaving uh, the U.S. than going to the U.S. now. That should be a hint. Now, I don't know how crazy it's going to get, but already down in uh, uh, Carolina this week, they've made it illegal to feed homeless people. And if you're a homeless person, you have to, I don't, I don't know if you have to, but I, yeah, they, make it, they actually made it illegal to be homeless, too. And, uh, and they say, if you're homeless and you're here and we catch you, we're going to put you in this camp and you can't leave. You can only leave with permission, and so you can see how quickly that can get interesting. So it's, it's happening, but it's going to happen much, much, much more. So when, I, when, I, when I'm here, I, I see a lot of people, and they're kind of like, well, everything seems OK, so I'm going to wait to make some plans. I'm not going, I, you know, everything seems OK. I'm not getting shot today, or, you know, some people are by cops, but not everybody. And, um, you know, the banks aren't closed or anything like that. And it's, this is uh, an illusion that is going to fade very quickly, incredibly quickly, probably in the next couple of years for sure, if not faster. It could happen any time. Even this whole Syria thing, which is just crazy, 8% of Americans support an invasion. And uh, Barack Obama said just today that, uh, I will ask Congress their opinion, but we have to show that we're, uh, we're united as a nation it's like 92% of people don't want to attack. You're, you know, it's crazy. But if they do attack, Syria has a deal with Iran that Iran will help them if they get attacked. Iran gets pulled in. Russia and China have already said, this can go crazy very, very quickly. And that's just one example. Just on the monetary front or on the, uh, the financial or the uh, front, those things are all going to collapse. It's a, it's a surety. If you actually understand the numbers, something's going to collapse. So this is, use this time while you still can to at least make some plans. So if you don't have a, um, anything outside of the country, get some of your assets outside of the country. It's not like the US government hasn't confiscated gold before. They did it in 1933. So we're not talking about anything that is crazy. This happened before. Uh, get some of your assets outside of the country and get, you know, get started thinking about 
the rest of the world. And the best thing about the rest of the world is there's so much opportunity, massive amounts of opportunity. If I was looking to do some good business, I'd go to Chile right now. If I was young and had no money, I'd go to Cambodia, cost you about $50, open up a bar with like three working girls in it. Uh, you know, you work, go from there. Uh, there's so much opportunity. Um, there's not, hardly any opportunity here anymore. So use this time, I really recommend it, to at least make some plans and get some of your assets outside and get some, if you think about starting a business, I see opportunities every hour in a place like Mexico or Chile or any, any other country like that. Uh, I don't see them as much here. I just, uh, it's just too much competition and too much government regulation. That was a long answer to your uh, question. But, uh, as far as I know, most everyone in the world uh, import shows are really high. So if you want to buy a lot of goods, raw materials, or gadgets, or whatever from China into anywhere else in the country, you know, in the world, you very expensive, wouldn't it? So yeah, the question, if you didn't hear him, is that uh, he understands, which is incorrect, but I'll explain that, that all countries have high import tariffs. Not every country has high import tariffs. Every country is different. Uh, Paraguay is an example. I don't think they have anything. There's a, actually a city in Paraguay called Ciudad del Este, and it's a complete anarchic city. It's actually on the border of Brazil and um, Argentina, I believe. And it's a complete free trade zone, like, but not government sanctioned free trade zone. You just do whatever you want. The, the amount of goods that go through there is crazy. Um, and, and it's because Brazil has quite high import tariffs. So they'll take it from Paraguay and bring it all in. Um, so yeah, you have to look at every country differently. Um, but I, I would say, like, take Chile, where they do have quite high import tariffs on some things. But the economy's booming, and there's so much money there that people still buy those products. Like, when I want to buy good electronics now, I go to Chile. Uh, I couldn't find this one laptop, which is the best of the best laptop, Samsung uh, a Series 9 with all the best, everything the best, because I spent my whole life on my computer, so it's important to me to have like, a really good one. I couldn't find it here. I went to like 10 Best Buys in three different cities, and they just had garbage. And I go to Chile in the mall, and every single store had that laptop. And you know, it's booming, and so you just have to look at different opportunities. You have to weigh all those sort of things like tariffs and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so you, you, you mentioned moving assets out of the country, and I've heard Simon Black say that, I've heard Casey. I've never heard any specific ways to do it. Any advice? I'd like give you an example of uh, physical gold. How do you move that out of the country safely? Kind of staying out of the radar. Yeah, no problem. I wrote a report at the Dollar Vigilante, which is free to our subscribers, called Getting Your Gold Out of Dodge. 100 page report and it gives you all sorts of information on how to internationalize your precious metals. Now if you're talking about physical gold and you actually want to move the physical gold, you can do it, but it's getting harder and harder. Uh, actually one of the major transportation companies that actually does transport gold internationally stopped accepting American clients recently. So you've got to start paying attention here what's going on. What I would advise is, and this is what I do, I just, I don't transport physical gold, I'll just if I have gold in a place and I want it somewhere else, I'll just sell it, take the hit, wire it over there, and buy it there. And you can buy it at a place like goldmoney.com, which has vaults all over the world, bullionvault.com. Uh, you could just wire it over to a place like Switzerland um, and just buy it there and put it, there's a private vault there. We've, you know, every place has all sorts of options. Um, so there's all sorts of ways to do it, but yeah, transporting the physical is very hard for Americans now. Uh, it's still possible. Uh, I'm not sure. Sorry? In the army? Sorry? Especially in the army? When you're traveling? The Did you like horses? Can you carry it? Okay. Oh, can you carry it? Oh, oh, carry. Yes, sorry. Uh, it's a very gray area. And I really recommend to people, if you're going to do that, I'll give you one example of a person who tried to do this. And they had, I forget how much. I think it was a few hundred thousand in gold coins. And they knew the, and they were going to go to Panama and put in a private vault there from the US. And they knew the rules of Panama. And I think they actually put the US, I think, or no, I forget what they did, but they did it all legally. So it was all like both the Panama and the US government had basically said, this is our rules, and they were going to adhere to it. The plane had an unexpected stopover in Mexico City, and they had to run through the customs guys, and they found it. 
And if he knew me, I'd get him out in two seconds, but he didn't at the time. Uh, but he was in jail for quite a while, and I think, they I think he eventually got his gold back, but I'm not sure about that. So it's tricky. And they, they make these rules very vague, and it really depends on even just the customs person where you are. Because even right now, if, you, if you're bringing money into the, or gold into the US, no one is really sure, because they always say if you have more than $10,000, you have to declare it. But they don't really say if gold is money and if it's the face value of the gold coin, which is a small amount, or if it's the actual value of the gold at that time. Uh, every country is sort of like that. But most countries are not as really seriously bad as the US in terms of uh, you know, checking stuff like that. Some countries are better, some are worse. Bolivia is horrible, just in case uh, uh, you didn't know. Uh, it's one of the worst places. They check through your bag coming in and coming out for anything. I've had them, like, they say they're looking for drugs, which is hilarious. And uh, they'll, they'll take your iPad and, like, go, what's this? And you go, it's iPad. And they'll, like, like <laughs> see, see if there's some cocaine in there. So it's crazy. So every country is different. So, yeah, if you're going to do that, what I would suggest is, if you're going to try to transport it, first of all, try to find a, a, an actual company who does that. But like I said, it's getting harder to do that for Americans now. If not, do your research, take a small amount first, uh, find out what's going on over there. Uh, you, know, you have to be careful. Uh, but I think it's well worth the effort because even if it takes you three trips and you, you have to spend some time over there figuring out and talking to people, even talking to the people there, you can call, you know, whoever the person is there and figure it out or hire a lawyer there even. You, know, like you, you might have to spend some money, but it'll be worth it because you'll then have it out. Uh, whereas here, I have no idea what's going to happen. Um, you were talking about starting an offshore corporation. Um, should we have an offshore identity or uh, papers or anything? Or can we do it with our US uh, license? You can still, as an American, open an offshore company in most places. Uh, the bank accounts get trickier, uh, but usually you can set it up in a way, and we have people who can help you figure it out, uh, how to do that. So you would have an offshore company in, say, Nevis or wherever, and then, of course, you need a bank account for it. So uh, we can actually help get a bank account set up, even if you are American, but it's just for the company. It's not in your own name, which they're still allowing. I don't know how much longer they'll allow that. Um, yeah, so that's basically how you do it. And you know, most of these bank accounts have ATM cards, and so you just use the money however you want. Uh, yeah. I remember Doug Casey talking about uh, if you're a young person, he suggests getting places in multiple um, countries. Mm -hmm. uh, do you agree with that? And also, what's some other advice you have for young people who have, um, are really fresh, don't really have too many ties, and are just, you know, don't want to be bogged down too much in the US? My advice, you know, a lot of parents uh, in the old days, decades ago, and even now, stupidly, but they uh, used to save up for their kids' education. Uh, and, they'd, you know, the kid would be 18, they'd have 10 or 20,000 or whatever they have. Don't do that anymore. If you, you know, talk to your parents about that and say, forget it, education's over. Uh, it's all, all information's free on the internet. You don't need to go to a college for four years and pay hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's all free. You can just do it. <coughs> And no one cares. A lot of people get confused. They think here in the U.S., oh, I need a college degree to get a job. Outside of the U.S., no one cares. They just care that you can do the job. Uh, I've never in my life ha ever had anyone even ask me for a, I only have a high school diploma, which I didn't even want to get that, but I did just for my mom. But no, no one's ever asked me for it, ever. And it, it, you know, I've been involved in all sorts of stuff around the world. No one ever goes, you know, what's your degree? It's like, no, like, you're talking to me. It's obvious I know what I'm doing here. Um, you know, so I would, I would uh, as parents and as kids, I would say to my parents, if I was a young guy, I'd say, you know, if I didn't have a lot of capital, I'd say, hey, I want to try something. I want to go to somewhere. And you know, spend a lot of time researching where you want to go. If I was younger, I'd go to Nicaragua or Cambodia. Uh, those are very, very cheap, very easy to just do anything. Um, and say, hey, um, you know, don't buy me a college education or help me with it. Uh, just get me a plane ticket round trip in case I get scared and want to come back or whatever. <laughs> and, uh, and a few thousand bucks to, uh, when I get there, I'll, first I'll go there, I'll hang out at a hostel for, you know, five dollars a day. Or, and very quickly I'll try to get to know everyone. I'll get to know all the hotel owners or expats and say, just go around and go, hey, I'm a young, hungry young kid. I'll do anything, you know, just, you know, you know, there's so many people who are very open to that. And you have a lot of advantages. You speak English. Every hotel needs people who speak English around the world. 
And you also understand American culture if they have American clients and stuff like that. Done now? Okay, so yeah, so that's what I would do is um, try to think more like that and, and take a chance. You know, start maybe closer to home, just, you know, if you're, I'd go to Mexico. Very easy. And uh, there's so many people we have in our groups and you just, you just write them and go, I, I think I'm coming down. You know, you know a good hostel I can stay at, you know some people I can talk to? They'll all say yes and they go from there. And I, I'm sure you'll see tons of opportunities. And you just gotta work hard and, you know, but you have the opportunity, uh, unlike in the US nowadays, it's, it's getting worse and worse. So that's it, thank you, peace. <laughs>